Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome back for part 3 of the Precambrian and its life history focusing on the Proterozoic. So before we go any further, let's just get the code word out of the way. The code word for this presentation is Uranium. I repeat, Uranium. That's U-R-A-N-I-U-M. So that's Uranium, like the radioactive metal. So please make sure you write that down and put it somewhere safe because you'll need it for the code word quiz. So now we're going to think about sedimentation during the Proterozoic. So by now we understand that Laurentia would have been quite a large area of continental crust and for quite large portions of the Proterozoic this crust would have been exposed and open to erosion. So there would have been very large quantities of clastic sediment being produced. This would have been transported across the continent by large rivers and the vast majority would have been deposited along the coasts um, to essentially add more mass along the margin of Laurentia. So during the Proterozoic, we also have the formation of three large fault controlled basins. And these basins would form topographic lows, which obviously would fill with water and sediments. Now, to be clear, these are not rift basins, so these aren't related to any kind of process associated with Wilson cycle, so they're something completely different. In this instance, what we have are areas of the crust, which are quite heavily faulted, and so fault movement has led to a depression forming, so blocks of rock have moved relative to each other along the faults, and it's resulted in a topographic low developing on the surface of the earth. This process is sometimes referred to as down warping. So the topographic low will fill with water, it will fill with sediment, but the thing about the sediment is, of course, it has a lot of weight to it. And so as you load more sediment into the basin, it's going to put more and more weight on the floor of the basin, isn't it? And this is actually going to push the rocks below down even further. So as more sediment gets put into the basin, the basin actually gets deeper to make room for more sediment. So these basins are primarily fault controlled and the basins themselves get deeper and deeper as more and more sediment gets loaded in. So the first basin that we're concerned about formed in the Great Lakes region and it occurred during the, well formed should I say, during the Paleo to Meso Proterozoic, so that's the early to middle Proterozoic. So within this basin we see, we see a sequence of passive margin uh, rocks, so we're going to see sandstones, shales and carbonates. So just like a, a nice boring passive continental margin, we're going to see the same sequence of rocks. So this is telling us, number one, that, you know, we have a, a nice, relatively boring environment. We know that, you know, the, the coast of this basin is going to be dominated by sandy sediments, which will then get muddier as you go into deeper water and then eventually all ending carbonates. Now, we also know that some areas of the basin must have been relatively shallow because we actually have stromatolite bearing carbonate rocks as part of the sequence. And stromatolites do tend to prefer to form in very shallow water. So we know there will have been some parts of this basin environment that will have been very shallow indeed, you know, the kind of depths where you could literally you know, wade into it up to your waist. So sediments were sourced from mountainous terrain produced by the 1.85 billion year old Pinocchian orogeny and the younger Granville orogeny, which occurred between 1.3 and 1 billion years. So I'm just gonna flip and come over here for a second. So here's the Great Lake Basin is what I've called it. So this area is the approximate uh, limit of it. So you can see within this area, we obviously have sediments which can be sourced from the high ground produced by the Pinocchian orogeny, which is located here. And we have sediments that can be sourced from the high ground created by the Grenville orogeny here. So sediments can come from either of those sources, they'll be transported in by rivers and they'll be deposited into the basin itself. The other thing which we can gauge uh, based on the, uh, the rocks is also a certain idea about the climate. So the fact we have these shallow water carbonates with stromatolites would suggest the climate would have been quite warm. So, you know, it's also another nice little piece of information that we can add to our model. So the second basin we're concerned about uh, formed in the Meso to Neo Proterozoic, so that's middle to late Proterozoic. And this particular basin extended uh, through an area which is now covered by modern day Montana, Idaho and the Canadian province of Alberta. Uh, 
once again we can see that this basin is filled with a sequence of sandstone shales and stromatolite bearing carbonates so just like the previous basin what we have is a relatively uh, tranquil setting we have a, a, a coast a basin margin which is going to be dominated by sandy sediments which will grade into muds and then into carbonates the presence of these stromatolites once again indicates there were some areas of very shallow water and the presence of the carbonates in general also hints at the fact that the environment would have been relatively warm so nothing particularly uh out, you know special there so the material that was actually being deposited into the basin was eroded from the high ground created by the trans hudson orogeny and then the resulting sediment was transported westwards into the basin so this second basin is over here i've called it the northern rocky mountain basins so this is the approximate area that it covered and you can see here's the trans hudson orogeny here so this is the high ground that's being eroded and the sediment obviously would have come off that been transported westwards and deposited into the basin so the third basin we're interested in uh, comprises the Grand Canyon supergroup. So obviously it's going to be you know, located in the Grand Canyon area down here. So the sediments within the basin themselves are Proterozoic and they're unconformably overlay they unconformably sorry overlay the crystalline Archean basement. So we have a, a basin essentially which is depositing sediments straight on top of the Archean basement. So the sediments were deposited between 1.2 and uh, 704, so 1.2 billion and 740 million years ago. So once again, that's Meso to Neo Proterozoic, so middle to late Proterozoic, and they actually consist of a sequence of shallow water and fluvial sandstone. So we have rocks which are essentially related to river processes and they're also related to essentially uh, coastal processes, the kind of things that would be happening in the beach environments along the margins of this basin. We also have shales, which will be associated with both river processes and uh, marine processes, so actually within the water itself. And we also have dollar stones. So dollar stones, if you remember, are altered limestones. So what we would have had is we see it appear to have an area where during some periods of time, the water depth was essentially very, very low indeed, during which time the area was covered in very, very large rivers, which would have transported sands and muds. But during other periods of time, we would have seen the basin fill up with more water. So the water level uh, increases. And so we would then would have seen the, the deposition of uh, sandy, muddy and carbonate sediments related to uh, essentially a more marine setting. In this sequence, again, we also have stromatolites, which suggests very shallow water. And we also have uh, carbonaceous algae impressions as well. And those two combined, once again, hints at the fact the water itself would have been warm and very, very shallow. In the case of the uh, this basin, it's a little bit more difficult to work out where the sediments are coming from in terms of the uh, the possible sediment sources well i suppose there is the uh, lano province down here in central texas but that's a bit of a journey uh, it may well be the sediments that are being deposited into the basin are just being sourced from the continental interior in general and there's no one area where they're primarily coming from so in terms of supercontinent formation during the Proterozoic, uh, we know obviously there have been several supercontinent cycles in Earth history. So a supercontinent is defined as the joining of two or more continental masses, although most examples in the geologic record will contain in excess of two. So most of them will contain you know, the vast majority of the continents around at the time. So we feel confident that given the accretion uh, along continental margins and the presence of ophiolites, we are happy that plate tectonics as we know it was fully operational by the Paleo Proterozoic. So by the time the Proterozoic started, we are happy with the idea that plate tectonics are working as plate tectonics is now. So as we covered last lecture, there is some evidence to suggest that there may have been two supercontinents during the Archean, called Valbara and Cornerland. Now, if these supercontinents existed, they would have been very small by supercontinent standards. That's purely because the pieces of continental crust that were involved would have been quite tiny. They wouldn't have had, you know, they wouldn't have had much mass to them. 
and that would be both laterally and vertically. So the pieces of continental crust wouldn't have been that wide and they wouldn't have been that thick. So it means obviously any supercontinent that formed would on the whole have been quite small. So geologists feel confident that a supercontinent called Nuna was present during the Paleo-Proterozoic, so about 1.8 billion years ago. And we're very confident that there was a supercontinent called Rodinia, uh, which formed between 1.1 and 750 million years ago. And then that was followed by Panatea, and that existed between 625 and 560 million years ago. So that's so that means uh, Rodinia formed in the Mesoproterozoic, and Panatea formed in the Neoproterozoic. So these are the proposed supercontinents. So you can see this is Nuna here. In terms of Laurentia itself, it's located right there. And so Nuna was between 2 and 1.5 billion years ago. Then it broke up, so all these pieces of continental crust went their own way. And they managed to uh, recombine about 1.1 billion years ago. So this is going to be about the time of the Grenville orogeny. So if you remember, so here's Laurentia. So here's the modern-day East Coast. And here's the modern-day Gulf Coast region. And so uh, the area, the deformation that we see here related to the Grenville orogeny is either due to the interaction of Laurentia with either uh, the Rio de la Plata uh, craton or the Amazonia craton, or maybe both of them combined. Whilst the deformation that we see down here in the, uh, in the more southerly portions of Laurentia would probably be related to the Kalahari uh, craton, uh, interacting with that region of the Laurentian coastline, although we can't be 100% sure about that. So that's the situation uh, with regards to Rodinia, and then Rodinia broke up about 750 million years ago and actually uh, recombined relatively quickly to give us Panatea. So around 750 million years ago, Rodinia broke up, but as I said, the pieces quickly coalesced to give us Panatea about 650 million years ago. So Panatea began to fragment around 550 million years ago. So this means it fell to pieces right at the end of the Proterozoic. It was a very last minute thing. So uh, continental collisions are certain as the continents are obviously constantly migrating. But obviously we have to ask the question of, well, why do these supercontinents break up once they form? So arguably the preferred model predicts that the supercontinent itself will actually have an insulating effect on the mantle underneath it. So you're going to have this big area of continental crust, which is going to act essentially like a giant duvet. And it's going to trap heat uh, in the mantle beneath it. And so this means the mantle underneath the continent is naturally going to get hotter. It's going to want to rise. And so that's exactly what it's going to try and do. And so this, the, because the mantle is rising, it's going to actually cause the crest above it, the crust above it, sorry, to stretch. And obviously, as we know, you can only stretch the crust so far before it breaks and faults. And that's obviously going to lead to rifting. And once we have rifting, well, then we start Wilson cycles. And so that's then going to break up the, uh, the supercontinent. It's going to send the pieces of continental crust off in their own individual directions. Okay, so that's it for the end of part one. So thank you for listening and take care.